So this morning we're talking about competition and specifically we're talking about the things that compete with our relationship with God. In the dictionary they use a number of terms to describe competition. Words like rivalry, opposition, battle, contention, and conflict. I think it's important that we keep those words in mind as we go through the message and as you think about how it is that you spend time with God. The reason is because when you pursue relationship with God, there is going to be opposition. There is going to be conflict. You are going to experience sometimes a day-by-day, -day, other times almost a moment-by-moment -moment battle between what is best and also what seems to be urgent and loud and important in your life. So let's set this idea up. There's a pretty good chance that most people in this room have said something like this in their past. Starting tomorrow... I am going to spend time with God every day by reading my Bible and praying. And you absolutely mean it. I mean, you're focused on this. You plan in advance for this to happen. So you, you plan your alarm. You plan about your coffee. You, you plan a nice, quiet place for you to just sit with Jesus in the morning. And you can just imagine what it's going to be like because you're going to sit in that place drinking your coffee, and it's like the truths of God's Word are going to fall out and change your life. The glory of God's going to fall. It's going to be incredible. So you can't wait for the next morning. Next morning comes, and your alarm doesn't go off. And that's odd because you really remembered setting it the night before. So now you're about an hour late and you kind of struggle to walk into the kitchen a little bit and you go in and you find out there's no coffee. And you talk yourself back down. You say, God is on the throne. We can make it through this. So you, you go and you make yourself a cup of hot tea. And you quickly realize why no one is bragging about their morning tea because... It's not good. I mean, bearable at best, but it's definitely not good. So you're suffering through this cup of hot tea, and you just sit in that chair with Jesus, and you're like, Jesus, you're going to have to take over this morning. Like, Jesus, take the wheel, because it's, it's not going to happen otherwise. And, and your eyes are closed, getting in the moment. You're in the zone, and it feels like someone's staring at you. And you open your eyes, and two of your kids are in the room. What are they even doing up? They don't get up for another hour from now, and somehow they're standing in the room, and about that time, something flashes past you, and it is your cat running for its life, and right behind it is your dog who's 15 years old, hasn't had energy in seven years, and it's in hot pursuit. And I mean, it is growling, and it is barking, and it's acting like it's demon-possessed, and you're a little overwhelmed with what is currently your life within that moment, and you get a text. It's your Aunt Sue. She has a surprise. They just thought it'd be great if the whole gang just swung by. So uh, they'll be here in 30 minutes. And you're thinking to yourself, 30 minutes, so you're scrambling. You're putting away dirty dishes, and you're picking up dirty socks, and, and you're trying to get your cat out of the curtain and your dog to stop barking, and you keep telling your kids, just go put on clothes. I don't care what you wear, just put on clothes. And then the doorbell rings. They made it here 10 minutes early. So you open up the door, and they brought a 15-passenger van. And there's like aunts and uncles and cousins you have not seen since Noah's Ark. And they come filing in your house like they're coming out of a clown car or something. And it's about that moment that it hits you. I'm not going to have a devotional time today. But starting tomorrow, I'm going to spend time with God every day by reading my Bible and praying. And you mean it. Guess what happens tomorrow? Brand new a day brand new distractions. Now, if there is a silver lining within this story, it is, it's not just you. 
everyone who pursues relationship with God is going to experience opposition. They're going to experience competition. They're going to experience distractions. And the reason is we are in a spiritual battle. The enemy knows that his only hope of defeating you is to distract you and discourage you, to drain you, and to deceive you long enough that you just give up completely and go do something else. The enemy knows that everything God desires to do in and through your life, he's going to accomplish out of the overflow of your relationship with him. So he's going to do everything possible to keep you away from that relationship. And he has an arsenal of distractions to choose from. It may be unforeseen circumstances like what I just described. Or it might be our careers. It might be our hobbies. It might be other relationships. It could be misplaced priorities or struggles with sin. It could be the love of money. It, it could be a crowded schedule or excessive busyness. The list is literally endless as to what he can use to distract us. When you pursue relationship with God, there's going to be opposition. And many times that opposition is not between what is good and bad. It's between what is good and what is best. How do we prepare for the battle? What are some hidden competitors that are lurking in the corners that will interfere with your relationship with God? What can we do to be proactive, to limit the distractions so that we can really focus on and go deeper in our walk with God? Let's find out this morning in the Word. So I invite you once again, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter number 3. We'll be in verses 7 through 11. I'm speaking this morning on the subject, the competition of relationship. We are still in Philippians 3. This is week number 4 in the exact same text. And we're studying what it means to be rightly related to God. And through the series, it is my prayer that we move past the bumper sticker taglines about relationship, and we actually experience relationship. We grow deeper in our knowledge of Christ. So we're going to read the text. I'll pray. We'll jump into the new material from there. So let's read. Verse number seven and following. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that our minds and our focus and our attention would be drawn directly to you. God, we ask today that your word would come alive, that your spirit would guide into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to take a few moments to reestablish the context and the truths that we have covered in the last three weeks. On week number one, we asked the question, what are we trying to achieve in the relationship? And we found that the goal is to know Christ. The goal is not Bible knowledge. It is not behavior modification. It is not religious practice. The goal is to know Christ. And the goal we set is often the target we hit. On week number two, we asked the question, why are we in the relationship at all? And we found that our motivation when entering relationship may unintentionally determine the extent of that relationship. God will use a number of motivating circumstances to get our attention to spiritual matters. It might be the death of a friend or a loved one. It might be a personal crisis, or it might be this internal longing for significance. It might be that you've hit rock bottom through addiction or through job loss or maybe through divorce. Whatever it is, God uses the circumstances to get your attention about spiritual matters, but the motivation must become the gospel. On week number three, we asked the question, what defines our relationship with God? And we discovered that our relationship with God is defined by love and made possible only by the righteousness of Christ. That is an important distinction to make because the nature of the relationship determines our conduct within the relationship. A boss-employee relationship is defined by work. A husband-wife relationship is defined by marriage. A Jesus-disciple relationship is defined by love. 
Different relational contexts are defined by different relational parameters. We need to know the nature of the relationship to understand how are we to act, what are we to do, and how are we to pursue Christ. So for three weeks, we have been stacking relational truths like cordwood. So far, we have talked about the goal of the relationship and the motivation of the relationship as well as the nature of the relationship. The goal tells us what we're trying to accomplish. The motivation provides our incentive to accomplish the goal, and the nature establishes our parameters as we pursue Christ. This morning, we studied the competition. We're going to ask the question, what competes with or interferes with our relationship? There's a number of truths that we're going to hit this morning, but here's the first of those. Key truth number one, competition is anything that interferes with or takes precedence over our relationship with God. Competition is anything that interferes with or takes precedence over our relationship with God. It would take us a month of Sundays to list out everything that can interfere with or take precedence over our relationship with God. In fact, just think about the big one. That is, you could say sin interferes with and takes precedence over the relationship. And that's absolutely true. And while sin is one word, the manifestations of sin could be hundreds, if not thousands of different ways that sin can control a person's life. We could say the love of money or the love of abundance or the love of power can interfere with and take precedence over a person's relationship with God. We could also say that some people have relationships that begin to take precedence over their relationship with God. Now, this might describe someone you know or might describe you as a matter of fact. And that is, there might be a time when you were pursuing God passionately. And then maybe you began to date a non-Christian or hang out with a group of non-Christians. And now you're kind of absent from biblical community. I mean, so absent, FBI couldn't find you if they wanted to. You're just gone. You've disappeared out of the mix. But we can't blame non-Christians on that because I'll say Christians can interfere with your relationship with God. You could be around some Christians that are so focused on religion and so focused on just going through the motions that, that they don't have joy. They, they don't have excitement. In fact, they hadn't had excitement since 1968. They, they hadn't seen the Spirit of God move in their life in 25 years. And if you hang out with that group long enough, they will suck the joy and excitement out of your relationship with God. You could also say that our routines... Our choices, our careers, hobbies, schedules, exercise, personal ambition, any number of things can interfere with and take precedence over our relationship with God. It's possible to desire God's blessings more than we desire Him. We want the gifts more than we want the giver. It's possible that we pursue church activity and religious activity more than we pursue God. It's possible that we pursue pastors and our favorite Christian authors more than we pursue Jesus himself. And one of the ways you know that is because when you have a question, instead of sitting with God and finding out what Jesus says on the subject, you go find out what your favorite pastor says on it or what your favorite Christian writer says on it. There's any number of things that can interfere with and take precedence over our relationship with God. That doesn't even include self-sufficiency, people-pleasing, misplaced affections, unwillingness to leave the past in the past, giving in to anxiety and discouragement, jealousy, glory seeking, you name it, all of them can interfere with and take precedence over our relationship with God. So in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul described at least eight competitors to relationship. They're kind of listed quickly here. I'm just going to go through you through those and tell you what the reference is going to be. It could be false teachers, verse number two. Overconfidence in the flesh, verses three and four. Religious heritage on religious practice, verse number five. It could be self-righteousness or misplaced zeal or good intentions, verse number six. Or it could be the blanket category of whatever in verse number seven. If you read verse 7, it says, but whatever things were gained. In other words, if there's something I missed along the line, whatever things were gained to me, I have now counted as loss. With the exception of false teachers that he mentions in verse 2. And by the way, he calls them dogs. Apparently, the Apostle Paul was not above name calling. 
He calls them dogs, evil workers, and the false circumcision. Apart from false teachers, Paul is personally testifying that he allowed each of these other things to become a distractor in his relationship with God. He pursued those things instead of God. He pursued those things to make himself right with God. And now he's looking back and he's saying, all of those things are now counted as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Uh, he, he talks about loss. I, I said in week number one, that is an accounting term. It is a negative Basically, what he's saying is, those things did not draw me closer, rather they took me further away. So I want us to pause here, and I want to kind of point out a similarity between the bulk of the things he was just describing in this list. Almost everything he described is religious in nature. I need to take just a moment to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Religious distractions can be the easiest distractions to justify. Because when somebody is saying, I am serving God by leading a small group. I'm serving God by planning a praise van. I'm serving God by taking care of kids or caring for the homeless or preaching a message. When somebody's saying, I'm serving God by doing those things, it's easy to justify why I can't spend intimate time with God because I'm serving God. Certainly God understands that's not the case. It's not that he doesn't understand. The issue is those things are easy to justify because it's far easier for us to do something for God than what it is to be with God. When you're with God, sometimes it's silent. When you're with God, sometimes it's convicting. When you're with God, sometimes he tells you things you don't want to listen to, and it becomes awkward, and you have to battle through some of that. It's easier just to say, I'm just going to go do this. I'm going to serve here. I'm going to help there and kind of check it off in your mind like, all right, I'm good with God. Sometimes our actions are based on identity and recognition. Let me explain what I mean there. When you spend time with God, no one is there to see that other than you. It's like you and God. When you finish praying, there's no one there to pat you on the back and say, that's a good job of praying this morning. When you finish your Bible reading, nobody comes up and claps for you and shakes your hand like you did a great job. Keep it up tomorrow. But whenever you are serving, teaching, singing, helping, it can be very easy to enjoy the recognition. It can be easy to do those things because you like feeling useful. And I'm going to be honest. There is definitely times when people are doing those things out of completely pure motives. They love God, and this is the overflow of what God is doing in their life. But I'll also be completely honest in saying sometimes we do those things that has nothing to do with a love for God. It has everything to do with self. It's about what I feel when I'm done. It's about thinking that somehow my actions are making me right with God. It's, a, it's about going through and doing those things because I've now built my identity around my skills as well as around my abilities. And sometimes people do that out of identity crisis as well as a need for recognition. But we have to remember, God did not call us first to service. He called us first to himself. Service is what God does out of the overflow of the relationship. You might want to write this reference off to the side in your Bible or in your notes. That would be Mark chapter 3. It's whenever Jesus was calling the 12 disciples uh, to himself. Here's what it tells us in verse 14. And he appointed the 12 so that they could be with him and that he could send them out to preach. Their appointment be with him. His part, I will send you out at the right time. Service flows out of relationship. So here's our key truth one more time. Competition is anything that interferes with or takes precedence over our relationship with God. That is anything. Anything also includes those unforeseen circumstances and other people and other relationships and even besetting sin. And because it includes all of those things, it's really easy for us to blame someone else or something else for why our relationship with God is suffering. 
It's, it's easy to come up with excuses. It, we say things like this, God, there's just too many distractions in my life right now to be able to focus on you. Or God, it's the people that are around me. If I didn't have these people around me, I think I could really pursue you the way I need to. Or the age-old one, God, the devil made me do it. That's the reason why I'm not as focused on my relationship as what I should be at this time. Here's what I'm trying to say. We can't blame everyone in everything if our relationship with God is shallow in suffering. God has done everything necessary for us to experience a vibrant relationship with him. And when I say everything, I mean everything. He created us for a relationship, redeemed us for a relationship, and does everything to make relationship possible. He gives us access in prayer. He gives us understanding through scripture. He gives us an invitation to boldly approach the throne of grace. He gives us new eyes to see, new ears to hear, a new heart to love, a new passion to pursue, new power to obey, new grace to sustain. He has done everything necessary for us to have relationship with him. So this last part is going to sting, but we're going to do it anyway. Today, you know as much about God as you want to know. Today, you are as close to God as you want to be. If there is ever a deficiency in the relationship, it has nothing to do with what he has done. It has everything to do with how we are pursuing or not pursuing him. So here's our second encouraging truth this morning. I say encouraging, that way you all will not recognize that was like a spiritual smackdown for all of us. So <laughs> key truth number two, it's encouraging. Uh, we must prioritize our relationship with God and value Him above everything else. We must prioritize our relationship with God and value Him above everything else. Now, we've already addressed some of those hidden competitors that interfere with our relationship with God. And remember, key truth number one is competition is anything that interferes with or takes precedence over that relationship. But now I want us to kind of deal with the second of those questions I asked at the very beginning. And that is, what can we do to be proactive? How can we limit the distractions? And for that matter, how can we continue to press on so that we grow deeper and deeper in our walk with God? Well, if you're going to compete in anything, and that is compete for grades, compete in sports, compete for jobs, it doesn't matter what the competition is, you need to prepare in advance, you need to have a plan, you need to have a strategy. A part of our preparation in advance, our plan and our strategy, is that we must prioritize our relationship with God and value Him above everything else. This should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. We don't all have the same jobs. We don't all have the same schedules. We don't all have the same knowledge. But here's what we do all have. We all have the same number of hours in a day. I'll make a promise to you. You will never find time to spend with God. You're going to have to make it. And in order for you to make it, he has to be a priority, the priority, and he has to be the greatest value in your life. In verse number 8, the Apostle Paul spoke of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. Uh, surpassing value, it speaks of greater value, exceptional value, superior value. He's saying knowing Jesus is far superior to anything else. I value him more than I value anything else. He is my highest priority. Knowing him is a priority, and it was based on a value. So track with me for just a moment, because this is just a sequence of logic that I'm going to lay out. Every decision you make to do something, to buy something, or to pursue something is also a decision not to do something else, or buy something else, or pursue something else. In other words, every time we make one decision, we are simultaneously cutting out some other decisions. 
And the reason is we have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of resources, a limited amount of mental bandwidth to even operate with. So in each of us, we can't do everything. We can't buy everything. We can't pursue everything, which is going to mean we have to make choices. And our choices are determined by our priorities and our values. If you wake up, Early in the morning, because you make a choice, I'm going to get up early in the morning to spend time with God. You also just made the decision, I am going to forgo some sleep to pursue God early in the morning. If you make the decision that you were going to invest in the kingdom of heaven, you're also making the decision you're not going to invest in your kingdom right here. If you make the decision that you were going to pursue biblical community. You just simultaneously made the decision, I'm not going to travel every weekend, I am going to join a small group, and I'm not going to live in an isolated life away from other Christians. Because one decision automatically sets up a chain of other decisions, and it also removes a number of other possibilities. So every step we take towards him or towards something else is based upon our priorities as well as our values. The Apostle Paul's values and priorities changed when he met Christ. All of the things that he valued prior to Christ and considered to be a priority prior to Christ, he now lists as a deficit. In fact, he couldn't equally pursue both of those. To pursue his life as a Pharisee would mean he could not pursue his life of following Christ. To pursue self-righteousness means he could not pursue the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. One decision for automatically means there's a decision against. I shared this illustration a number of years ago, and I feel like it's very relevant based on our current topic this morning. The story or illustration, I don't know if it's true or not. Most illustrations are not. Preachers just make them up along the way. So anyway, this particular illustration is one in which there is a teacher who had a group of students in a lab and took a glass jar and filled the jar all the way to the top with a number of bigger rocks and asked the students, is the jar filled? And the students said, yes, the jar is filled. And then the teacher took some pebbles and poured the pebbles over top of the rocks and they trickled in all around the bigger rocks and they filled the container up at another level. And the teacher asked, is the jar filled? And the student said, yes, the jar is absolutely filled. And then the teacher took some sand and poured the sand over top of the rocks and over top of the pebbles and it went around all the little crevices and crooks and crannies and filled all the way from the bottom to the top. And the teacher asked, is the jar filled? And the students, a little hesitantly this time, said, yes, I think it's filled. To which the teacher then pours water over top of the sand, over top of the pebbles, over top of the rocks, and it presses the sand down, and it takes out the air gaps, and it fills it up a little bit more. And the teacher said, is the jar filled now? And the students didn't want to answer. So then the teacher asked, what is the lesson I'm trying to teach? And one student said, There's always more room in the jar. And she said, no, that's not the lesson. The lesson is if you don't get the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in later. Intimacy with God, relationship with God, knowing Christ, that's the big rocks for our jars. Everything else can fill in around it. But if that is not the first thing in the jar, nothing else will ever be in the right proportion. You can focus on relationships, and God made us relational creatures. We need relationships. You can focus on relationships to the detriment of your relationship with God, and those relationships will never bring the joy that God intended. You can focus on your career and say, God understands, you know, I'll I'll spend more time with God when things slow down. You can focus on your career and you can get to the very end. Maybe it's retirement. Maybe it's a, a time down the road that you've set in your mind. You can get there, but if you had to bypass your relationship with God, if that has suffered so that the career could advance, it's never going to bring the joy and the fulfillment that you hoped it would. It it has to be that he is the priority. He has to be the first one in that jar, and other things can fill in around him. But if he's not first, everything else is always going to be out of proportion. In Philippians chapter 3, 
the Apostle Paul evaluated what mattered most to him. And he tells us that knowing Christ is the surpassing value. My question is, what matters most to you? We must prioritize our relationship with God and value Him above everything else. Why? Because anything that interferes with or takes precedence over our relationship with God is competition. And God has a way of prying back our fingers from the things that we're holding on to and removing the stuff that has been taking his place in our life. And sometimes that process is incredibly painful. And he doesn't do it because he hates us and he doesn't love us and he's mad with us. He does it because he loves us so much that he knows what is best And when we hold to something more than we're holding to him, we've set up a false idol, a false God, a false place of refuge. But when we hold on to him as first and foremost, everything that comes with him is now ours to experience. But if we leave him out and say, I'm going to pursue this first, it'll never be in right proportion. I'm going to challenge you today. Ask yourself the question, what do I value the most? And don't just say Jesus because that's the Sunday school answer. Say Jesus because he's the one you value the most. And if that's the case, you prioritize him in the relationship over everything else. And that's going to mean a decision to be with him will be a decision not to do something else. That means if you're going to get with him early in the morning while you're focused, at least I'm focused in the early morning, about three of you out there focused in the early morning. For us, that early morning time is going to be our best time. It's our best focus. So I'm going to give that time to him because that's where I want my mind to be at the sharpest point in my day. But also doing that's going to mean I can't read every newspaper. I can't read every magazine. I can't spend 17 hours a day on social media. I can't do these other things because a decision to pursue him is simultaneously a decision not to to do something else. Make it a priority to pursue him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God. Again, this is our fourth week in the same text. And every single week, there's another way we can come back and look at the text and walk away with other truths that help drive home the points of relationship. God, I pray today that we would recognize those small hidden competitors to our relationship with you, that you would gently and mercifully walk us through those, that we don't hold on to those to the point that you're having to pry our hands off, but God, we keep our hands open and we desire to be with you. And Lord, we we simply say, God, I trust you in this. So Lord, we pray that you would do what we cannot. In Jesus' name, amen.